could take a personal moment and just have a, a time of celebration. Today is the anniversary for uh, Mac Jordan being with Buford Road Campus for five years and Pastor Jake at the Village for five years. Would you congratulate them with me? Let them hear you this morning. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, I, I love the bumper video, this kid that's describing having the training wheels taken off. How many of you remember having the training wheels come off your bike? I, I remember it was a game-changing moment for me in my life. I, I felt like I was 20 years older than I really was. I felt like there was this newfound freedom. I thought that I could just now go anywhere that I wanted to go, all because the training wheels had been taken off my bike. Well, we all have these markers in life that are what I would call game changers. Perhaps you could look at your own life and decide that, well, yeah, when I met this person, that was a game changer in my life. When, when I had this particular event take place in my life, that was a game changer. My life was never the same again. Or, or when I went to a, t a particular event and experienced it. Uh, you think back to those, those markers in life that were game changers. Uh, today, as the beginning of introducing our next sermon series, I, I want to kind of look at this for you as this being a marker in my life and what I think can be a marker in the life of Bon Air Baptist Church and all of our campuses in all of our spiritual journeys because I think it has the opportunity for it to be a game changer for all of us. I was introduced by uh, John Sawyer, our campus pastor at James River. Uh, to Peter Scazzera. Peter Scazzera is the pastor of uh, New Life Fellowship Church in Queens, New York. They run about 1,500 on Sunday mornings. And the awesome thing about their church is they have uh, had this masterful thing happen whereby this cross-cultural connection has been made. They have over 73 nationalities in their church in leadership positions and people who are, are members of their church and of their mission. And so it's an incredible vision to see that. Uh, Peter's an author of two best-selling books, uh, The Emotionally Healthy Spirituality book and also The Emotionally Healthy Church. Now, he has five or six other titles that he's published and printed. But this book, The Emotionally Healthy Church, uh, excuse me, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, uh, for me has become a game changer. And, and although this is a new material to me and perhaps to you, uh, James River Campus has been uh, making this a part of their culture for the last six years. And so we've seen some wonderful advances. And so I, I wanted to bring this to you because this is turning out to be a game changer for me. It, it's making me examine 47 years of a Christian walk with Jesus in ways I never have. I would say to you that it's challenging and transforming my marriage with Paula. We're working through this strategy for discipleship together, and it's changing our marriage. It's changing uh, my leadership style in terms of how um, I relate to our staff and to others who I have the opportunity to lead. And so it's my desire to kind of introduce you to this work in this cur current sermon series and I want you to know, large portions of what I'll be sharing come from Peter Scazzaro's work. I called Peter a couple of weeks ago and I said, yo, Pete, look, I, I just need to tell you, I'm going to be preaching your book. He said, don't even tell him. Don't even tell him. I said, no, no, no. I, I get that, but I, I'm just telling you, I'm compelled to, to share this. So I want you to know that pieces of this journey are mine, but in large part supported coming out of this work that Peter Scazzaro has done. So I started my journey with Christ 47 years ago. I was 10 years old. Remember it as clear as it happened this morning. A sermon was preached and I fell under this conviction that I knew I had to walk the aisle. I knew the difference between good and bad. I knew the difference between evil and goodness and that God was representing one and Satan the other and I needed to choose God and I walked that aisle. I was baptized that Sunday night by my father who was a pastor and they didn't think that'd be enough so they asked the pastor of uh, First Baptist Church Winston-Salem to join him in the water so two of them put me back and I guess waited a while and agreed that it was time to bring me up but uh, that's when I began my journey and, and as I think back about that I, I think to myself wow 47 years of experiencing a journey with Christ and then I think well you know what, over two-thirds of that Christian journey has been as a, a pastor, as a shepherd, as 
a leader of others, not only proclaiming the Word of God, but, but leading out in this and saying, you know, showing this is the, the way this needs to be done. And, and I guess you along with me might think, well, gee, after 47 years, you would think that there might be some master level of spiritual maturity that has been reached in that time. But I need to confess something to you that in some areas where I have grown in leaps and bounds and would, might claim some level of maturity, that in being introduced to this latest work that we're going to be looking at, I begin to understand that there's some areas in my life below the surface I need to take the training wheels off. When you think about an iceberg, you see the image. They tell us that you can only see 10% of the iceberg. That's what sunk the Titanic, by the way. But that iceberg, you can only visually capture in your mind's eye 10%. This particular strategy for discipleship we're going to be looking at that I think has a marker and a life opportunity as a game changer for all of us would suggest to us that what God really wants to get at is the 90% below the surface. So it was said by some church member who said, well, you know, I was a Christian for 22 years, but rather than having 22 years of experience as a Christian, it was like I was a one-year-old Christian 22 years. And then said, I kept doing the same things over and over. Can I get a witness? I, along with many others, have suffered from what is referred to as tip of the iceberg spirituality. It's that part that consumes so much of us because we think to ourselves that's what's seen and it is. And so I want to suggest to you today the title for the message is this, Mission Control, We Have a Problem. We have a problem. Only about 10% visible to the eye. So when it comes to our spiritual walk, that 10% represents what other people see in us. And we work at making sure they see the right things. And for the most part, it's, it's pretty good stuff. I mean, they would say, well, he or she is a Christian. I mean, look, they, they, they seem to be really nice on Sundays. <laughs> they dress up and clean up. And, 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 oh, oh, and they've been a longtime member of a Sunday school class or a small group. And, and, and oh, I, I see them involved in a mission project. And, and gosh, I, I, I bet they even say grace before meals and maybe even sometimes out in public too. And I bet they have a devotional life every day. And if not, if they can't get to it, well, I bet on their commute to work they talk with God. And so the truth of the matter is that for the most part, that's the 10% above the surface that everybody sees that looks pretty good. Meanwhile, there's 90% of us that is below the surface that God wants to transform. And so I've come to understand something that it is impossible to be spiritually mature and be emotionally immature. It is impossible to be spiritually mature and to remain emotionally immature. Until recently, I really, haven't dis I really hadn't discovered this connection between what we might call emotional maturity and spiritual maturity. But then it dawns on me as I'm reading this material, I think to myself, but when they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He said, well, the first is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Talk about a connection of emotional maturity and spiritual maturity. Here it is set, but, but here's the issue. I keep looking at this image of the 10% above and what's going on in the 90% of you and of me, and that means the church at large as well. What does that look like? What, what needs transforming there? Because it makes me think, mission control, we've got a problem. We all bought into 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone's in, anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. Said in contemporary language, I've taken the training wheels off. I'm yours, Jesus. Let's ride. And if that were completely true, then why are we only allowing God to affect the 10% above the surface? If that were true, why do we attempt to hide 
or even ignore the 90% below the surface. If that were true, why have we allowed Jesus not th- this availability, this option for him only to come and transfer, transform us superficially? Like what's seen rather than going deep with him. If the old is gone and the new has come, then why have we put so much of ourselves just into that visible portion of Sunday only and then when we leave worship, we're miserable Monday through Saturday because of the 90%. And I'll tell you why for me. Because it's painful and it's scary. For me to stand before you with 47 years of experience, two-thirds of that pastoral, and for me to admit to you that I have not made this connection of being emotionally mature that it will allow me to grow deeper spiritually with God is painful for me. We haven't even gotten to the stories yet. And it's frightening because there's a part of me that you really do not know me, not the me that I see when I look in the mirror every morning. John 8, 31, 32 says it so well. Jesus says to the Jews who believed them, who believed him, if you hold to my teaching, then you really are my disciples. And you'll know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Here's the reality of that for me. I think Jesus left something out. He, he should have said here, as he talked to the Jews who believed him, saying, if you hold to my teaching then you really are my disciples, but you're going to know the truth and it's going to hurt. Then it'll set you free. Go back with me to taking the training wheels off. My daddy was right there behind me, hand on the back of that saddle I was sitting in and he said, Tom, you can do this, you can do this. I mean, I can hear that voice in my ear and he gave, you know, after he's running along next to me, he gives me that final shove and yes, five or ten seconds in, I got this and then what? Do any of you remember Methylade? <laughs> oh, there are some older people here today. Yeah. We'll probably need to describe that to some of our millennials. Let me just say, it's pretty in pink and hurts like crazy. Blow. <sighs> wow. Scrapes, cuts, bleeding. I don't remember how many times that before... Before I could ride that bike freely. How many times I got hurt. And that pain you see right now has nothing to do with scrapes on the outside. Because I've gotten this opportunity for us that together we might really invite the Lord down into us deeply to begin to transform some things that are going to hurt first. And then we'll be set free. But I need you to understand, I need to confess to you and own some stuff as we get started in this journey because I've made some mistakes in my spiritual life in which one of those was I believed that doing for God was the same as being with God. And so it really worked well for my workaholic personality that I thought, okay, God, watch this. I'm just going to do for your kingdom like nobody's business. And listen, none of the doing was bad. The problem was I equated the doing as the same as God transforming me. And when you think about it, it makes no sense. How did I ever think that if I do all these things for God on the outside, that that'll change me on the inside? Wrong. We can do a lot of good and very spiritual things on the outside, and the inside never change. Doing things on the outside does not equate to a transformation on the inside. You know this as well as I do. There are people you know that are incredibly spiritual in that 10% on the outside. They, they look and they do so much good and they're, they, and they're mean as a snake. Do you, do you know anybody? Don't turn and look at your spouse. Do you know anybody? <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? They do good things are and as mean as a person could be on the inside. You see, that's 1090, folks. 
That's 10% of above the water spirituality as opposed to the 90% where all of us really live when we look in the mirror. And that's what God wants to get to. And yes, I'm guilty of having preached all my life and having heard all my life when somebody says, how do I get closer to Jesus? More Bible study. More prayer. And then when you do more prayer, pray some more. And then join a Sunday school class, a small group, and then, well, gosh, get involved in a mission project and and show, show loyal commitment to God in the doing of all these things. And yet, it never dawned on me the invitation was never to go deeper to be with God as opposed to just doing for God. And so I was a part of the problem, not a part of the solution. None of those aforementioned things are bad. I would tell you all the time, yes, more Bible study, yes, more prayer, yes, more involvement in the mission of the church, but that does not equate to transformation on the inside. One comes out of the other, not backwards. We'll get to this later in the series, but it occurs to me the longest commandment is the fourth. It's about the Sabbath. What? Yep. Because God created for six days, and on the sixth day, he made you and he made me. And then on the seventh day, he said, go to work. Oh, no. No, he didn't. He said, rest. Then go to work. So our work came out of our rest. Have we gotten that backwards? Because we work like dogs in order to rest. 10%, 90%. This painful reality. You see, because pain has a way of opening us up. It is painful for me to become transparent and vulnerable, not only with you, but with my my God, who, who I know knows me and sees me. But for me to own this, truth be told, in some ways I have cared more about that 10% and nurturing that because that's what my neighbors see than really falling prostrate before the Lord and saying, come, you, you got to come. And if it means hurting me, with them, then let's do this thing because I want to be transformed. And yet there are areas in my life I, I need to take the training wheels off of. Even with all my biblical knowledge, all the seminary training, all the leadership position experiences I can tell you about in skills, not any of those can transform me on the inside. That's Holy Spirit work, and it's painful. And I want to confess to you, I've been a part of the problem, not a part of the solution. Because I, too, promoted this thing that American culture says bigger is better, right? Bigger is better. So how does that fit in the church? Well, that means noses, nickels, and nails. That means the more people you get, then the more spiritually mature you are, right? Okay, well, how about... Nichols, the more money you have in the budget, then people look and say, now that is a spiritually mature church. Okay, how about nails? Oh, look at that facility they've got. Now that's a spiritual, spiritually mature bunch of people right there, right? Wrong. We can have all of that. And all we are touching is the 10%. But the world looks at us and says, whoo. Ooh, that Bonaire and their campuses, they got it going on. Really? I've been a part of this. I, rem- I was a part of that generation in which we came out, you know, the glory days when everybody went to church, it was the thing to do. I mean, so, you know, church attendance, all you had to do was open the doors and people came. A- and Sunday school attendance and small group attendance, oh my goodness, sometimes there was more in Sunday school than there was in worship. That might have said something about the preaching, I don't know. But nonetheless, and we, and we say, oh my gosh, oh, what about Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, Sunday night training union? I mean, there was those times where you could earn these LifeWay certificates and, you, and, and I want to say, so yes, all that was awesome, but did it go below the surface? Did it transform the 90% of the people who were sitting there? Because if it did, I'm wondering where that generation is. If that were the only answer to to just pack a pew, then we're spiritually mature. We can do that. There's all kinds of tricks we can do. All kinds of stuff. But you and I know better, don't we? 
This kind of transformation calls for a, a, a vulnerability and a transparency that is going to be painful. I was a part of the problem and not the solution when I fell into that trap that what I do for God is more important than who I am in God. That's another social norm. What do we do when we meet people? Hi, my name is. Oh, hi, my name is. What's the next question in our mouth? And what do you do? Because we need to know what you do so that we can now rank you. Right? Hi, I'm Tom. Oh, what do you do? I'm a pastor. Shoo. Okay. What do you do? I'm a car salesman. Oh, grab your billfold. Pick your profession. We've picked on each other all our lives. Pick your profession. We got these stereotypes because we want to we want to figure out where you are in the strata. And so I I'm a part of the problem and, and not the solution when I get so caught up in not understanding who I am is more than what I do. I'm a child of God. I'm as much a child of God whether I'm standing here preaching as the pastor of Bonaire. I was just as much a child of God when I came out of college and my first job was cleaning Krispy Kreme, the donut shop. I love that job, by the way. <laughs> And it loved me. Amen. Yes. It was like a marriage. Anyway. Do you hear what I'm saying? We, we, we get so caught up in who am I? Well, it's what I do. I, I'm here and I'm... Oh, no. No. See, this transformation that God wants... We're talking about the 10% when we do that nonsense. And I'm a part of the problem and not the solution when my actions promote that 10%, that superficial Christianity that says let's measure who we are as Christians by the outside measurement rather than by the inside measurement. Let me, let me try to bring all this to current. I believe God wants to transform me. I believe God wants to transform you. And I know he wants to transform us as a body of believers that maybe for the first time in our life we stop focusing on the 10% above the surface and to take what may be the most painful journey of taking the training wheels off of our spirituality that we've ever done in our life. It's impossible to be spiritually mature and emotionally immature. The Apostle Paul talks about this in Galatians 5.22. What he talks about, that fruit, that when Jesus comes, when we let him into the 90%, the fruit begins to bear so that the love is really seen in our affection for others. It comes from the deepest transformation. That joy, we have an exuberance about life that people don't get. Bad things can happen. Huh. I want a joy for the Lord that comes from the inside. This week has been painful in my life. We had to put our Beagle, 17 years old, down. And then I drove to Roanoke and did the funeral of a pastor friend who drove into a bridge. And I want a joy for life that overcomes all of that, the circumstances. I want that peace that will bring me a serenity that passes understanding. I want that patience. Lord, I want that patience. That willingness to stick in there. I, I want the kindness, this sense of, of compassion in my heart, this goodness, a conviction that holiness permeates everything and everybody. How would that make a difference in the way we live if we understood that everything and everybody has holiness in it, that God's presence is common in our midst? Would it change the way we treat things and people? I want that. 
I want the faithfulness to be involved in loyal commitments. I want the good, the gentleness. Listen to this. I want the fruit of the spirit of gentleness. It means not having to force my way in life. And I want self-control. And I guess I, I'm here to testify to you today that I'm going to start this journey. I want you to come with me. We've got to take our training wheels off. And there's going to be some painful, transparent, and vulnerable moments. And we'll never be the same again. Pray with me. Father God, into these moments now we recognize the movement of your Holy Spirit. So Father, even as we begin this journey together and we try to understand what it is that's kind of made us unhealthy, kind of like going to see the doctor and we need to get a diagnosis before we can get treatment. I pray that you'll help us understand these symptoms of being unhealthy in our spirituality, that you'll help us own them, and then we can look forward to hearing the solution. What is it, God, you would offer us to move out of our emotional immaturity so that we can become spiritually mature, so that we can really make space for the fruit of the Spirit in the 90% below the surface? Lord, if there's anybody who's heard this message today and has never received you as Lord and Savior, I pray in the moments that follow this message they would receive you as king of their life. You want nothing but the best for them. Here and now, in abundant life, and there and then, in eternal living. And for those of us who know the old, old story and have been living a 10% unhealthy spirituality for a long time, Come to us, Father, and convict us. Help us to know how to respond in these moments. We make our prayer in the name of the one who is always faithful to us, hoping that we will be as faithful to him.